Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. I wanted to start this episode off with a commemoration of one year since Chris Krebs, the former CISA director, was fired by our former president, Donald Trump, in a tweet for defending our election security. So CISA was a very little-known minor federal agency a few years ago, and now because of that, it has become a household name, and I think it has had the opposite reaction of what our former president had wanted and election security is stronger than ever and CISA has a better relationship with those election officials and it has become a much more important agency in the whole cyber defense infrastructure that we're trying to build in this country so I wanted to commemorate that as we're talking about elections from last year In the news, the DOJ actually charged two Iranian hackers for threatening U.S. voters during the 2020 election. The Department of Justice charged two of the hackers for their involvement for disinformation that targeted American voters ahead of the 2020 presidential election when they sent threatening emails to Democratic voters in Florida where they threatened to physically hurt them if they did not vote for former President Trump. And they also allegedly attempted to break into 11 state voter registration and information sites where they stole about 100,000 state voter information. So I think that is the first time that DOJ has ever charged any foreign nationals in the actual election tampering. And unfortunately, I think both of these are still in Iran, so there's probably going to be little action to bring them to justice, but it is something to actually have this on paper. And as we're talking about Iran, there was some more news that was released just recently where there was a joint advisory put out by a bunch of different agencies like from the United Kingdom, Australia, the FBI, and CISA on how the Iranian government is sponsoring cyber actors to exploit Microsoft Exchange, and Fortinet vulnerabilities. So we'll link the advisory in the show notes, but if you read through this, it has the entire MITRE attack chain for tactics and techniques that are being documented in use in the wild, as well as IOCs, different file hashes, tools that the attackers are using that you can look for, scheduled tasks and actions, and email addresses that they're using for exfiltration, And mitigations. And of course, the mitigations are that you should patch immediately. So if you have any Fortinet appliances or if you're running Exchange on-prem, these are vulnerabilities that have been patched. So make sure that you go and do that. So I wanted to talk about another news article that I came across that is quite long and again we'll link the story in our show notes but it is a editorial on how amazon for failed to protect data consumer data over the last few years the article is quite long but it is a very very good read and I think you can find a lot of parallels to how some companies may scale up very quickly, put the business before security and kind of toss out controls in the name of being expedient and having the permissions to do things right away. And that can be very bad for security. And so as the model has changed over the years, we have this zero trust model, which we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. And that means you'd want to try to limit as much exposure to this stuff as possible. I just wanted to kind of quote some of the things that I found in the article. If you don't get a chance to read it, 
one of the things that they talked about is in the name of speedy customer service and unbridled growth, a rapid fire invention on behalf of customers in the name of delighting you, Amazon gave broad swaths of its global workforce extraordinary latitude to tap into customer data at will. It was as former Amazon chief of security officer, Garen Gagnon called it a free for all of internal access to customer information. And as information security leaders warned that free for all left the company wide open to internal threat actors while simultaneously making it inordinate, inordinary difficult to track where all of Amazon's data was flowing. So I find this often at companies too, where you may have a policy and they actually stated when they were testifying to Congress that it was against internal policy to look up data that wasn't directly involved with a call that you're getting for directly involved with a call that you're getting for directly involved with a call that you're getting for you have a company policy that you're not supposed to do something, but you don't have any technical controls. And then you leave it up to like the goodwill of your employees to not violate that policy. And what happened was they had people just looking up anyone's purchases at, at, at will. So purchases of famous movie stars and pop stars, they would like scoop out their particular purchase logs. And that all just kind of went un, um, it, it went uh, unnoticed as well, but also just there were no repercussions for it. So I think oftentimes when you have a company policy and the business side is like, oh, we have a policy against this, you often should advocate for the technical controls to prevent someone from doing it altogether. This was a, as you said, a, a super interesting article. It's a scintillating read to where you'll want to keep reading it and see where it goes next. Amazon's culture is really interesting. And if this is the first time you've read about Amazon culture, it will introduce you to some of the concepts of Amazon's culture, such as whenever they have a meeting, they don't do PowerPoint slides. They do a six pager. So you show up to the meeting. If you kind of call the meeting with a six page single spaced document laying out what you want to talk about. And everyone at the start of the meeting sits down and reads that six pager before you have a discussion on it. That way nobody shows up and didn't do the homework and can't contribute meaningfully to the conversation. And so a lot of the reporting in this article comes from six pagers that had been written to be discussed by leadership in the information security team. And then they also go into some of the other kind of cultural aspects of Amazon that had been instilled from a, a very beginning by Jeff Bezos, including things like the two pizza rule where teams should always be able to be fed by no more than two pizzas. If a team, you know, can't, then it's too big or they have this fanatical focus on it always being day one because day one is that first day of a startup and you're trying to figure everything out and you've got that enthusiasm and that energy and that almost hubris and excitement to do new and innovative things. And when it becomes day two, then you're in trouble because you've lost that kind of entrepreneurial edge that day one brings. And these are all kind of concepts along with Amazon's talks frequently about customer obsession and, and how they want to be, you know, the world's most customer centric company. And they almost hide behind that with some of the, the rationale behind the, the structure of, of how things worked internally to Amazon. And we should also clarify here that none of this is talking about Amazon web services, by the way, AWS, which is, you know, Amazon's cloud computing and PaaS and IaaS uh, offering this is related to specifically Amazon's core retail consumer facing business. And, and so ultimately, Andy, I think you'll, you'll kind of call out some additional examples here, but it just sounds like there was this culture. And, and I think you hit the nail on the head where 
in service of all those concepts I just mentioned that, that Bezos had instilled from the very beginning of customer obsession, customer centricity, uh, innovation, speed, security became this kind of afterthought. Like, we'll come back and do security later. Well, it's really hard to do security that way, as we all know. I know I'm preaching to the choir a little bit on, on the program here, but for anyone who is maybe not in information security and in his other parts of technology, this is a really important concept to understand that Amazon had built this incredible, we'll call it a data warehouse of customer information and transactional information and with different abilities to access it. And what would end up happening is as the team wanted to build something new and cool, they might copy data out of that data warehouse and build their own data warehouse. And now that data is off somewhere else and we may not have a trail of who accessed that one. And that's where you get in a situation really, really quickly that you just don't have the ability to even wrap your arms around it. You don't even know what you don't know because this is spread so rapidly versus if you start with security from the beginning and, and loosen that over time to get to the right level, then you have very strong visibility and audit trails and controls into, okay, here's where potentially our gaps or our risks or who would have accessed this or whatever. And, and so I thought the other part of this article that's very, very interesting is as GDPR came online in Europe, Amazon was very kind of dismissive of the need to build a GDPR practice and to adopt some of those requirements and bake them into their technology to the point where they were looking at, I mean, where they, they were hundreds of millions of dollars in fines from the European Union over their lack of GDPR compliance. And so just, just an incredible article where you have this perception that like, oh, big companies like Amazon, you know, it's a literally almost a $2 trillion company, like 1.8 something at last glance. They have more money than anyone, but even there, they have to deal with budget and headcount and leadership turnover and lack of investment from the business and lack of interest from the business in adopting a security practice. And even at these tech behemoths, it shows you that they too can look like they've got it all together, but they can be dysfunctional on the inside when there isn't buy-in and there isn't budget to have a, a security organization. And that I think is just truly astounding to read. Yeah. I think you nailed it on the head there. Adam is it really documented how dysfunctional and chaotic their security team was when the business treated them as a line item or a cost center instead of a business partner. And I think it's really important these days that the business partners with security to enable the business instead of dismissing it and treating it like a cost center. And so, you know, it, it talked about how the, the information security leader there had a team of 300, which sounds really small for a company like Amazon. You know, he's, he probably needed more like a thousand, but they were not willing to hire more folks. Their budget was assume it's going to be zero unless, you know, you actually get something. Um, and then they had, you know, multiple problems that I was not even aware of. I don't think a lot of this was reported in the media, but they had different audits that found loopholes where, you know, tens of thousands of employees had the ability to spoof a seller account, which allowed them to issue refunds or view customer orders as if they were the vendor. They discovered American Express credit card numbers that were outside of a PCI you know, data zone, and they were unable to track whether or not anyone had accessed those credit card numbers because the logs only went back 90 days. And there were other crazy uh, stories like at the end where they talked about a seller who was having issues with her seller account and her reviews getting hijacked or her uh, shipments 
were were not correct where she would actually order from her own site and get shipped something that was completely different even though she was the seller and it turned out that there were people that were recruited by a malicious actor on LinkedIn and Facebook and he paid them to have basically godlike access in the system and they would change things and so insider risk is a huge deal and that plays into a lot of this whole zero trust model where you have, you know, you should have limited access to only the things you need. So, I mean, that's, that's a huge part of their problem. And so I thought it was eye opening that even like you said, a behemoth like Amazon would have major security problems similar to any other company, you know, that we kind of talk about on this, on this show. Actually, in a lot of ways, Amazon sounds less mature than most of my customers. I mean, there is a shocking lack of control here, a, a shocking lack of oversight, uh, a horrible practice around uh, just enough access, just in time access, stuff like that, like just mind boggling. And you nailed it when you said insider risk, because that was the phrase I was going to use too. What this is so, what this is such a good illustration. A lot of people think like you need to implement a just in time, just enough access practice to limit the risk when a malicious actor potentially would gain access to that account to protect how much damage they could do. But that's not what's going on here. These are people who work for Amazon or are contracted by Amazon who are just acting badly and they're internal and it's because they have more access than they need or should have. And it's just illustrates the point that yes, we need to worry about the bad guys and the bad actors and the external bad actors, but there are internal bad actors too. And having good hygiene and good practices for all of the things we talk about. And we always talk about just do the basics, you know, this is such a good example of that. It, it's just, gosh, this is mind boggling. It's, it's a really good read. I, I listeners, I really hope you go out and, you know, we, we put a lot of good stuff in the show notes, but this is on wired. It's a, beautifully written and researched article. And again, we're not here to like dump on Amazon because I'm sure I'm going to spend a ton of money with Amazon this holiday season. Uh, but at the same time, it, it is breathtaking. It really is. And I, I let me put myself before the kind of judge and jury here. I have sat here on this show in front of this microphone and I made the point, Andy, I said, you know, as much as we don't love the privacy practices of Amazon and Google, they're really good at security. You know, like you never hear of security problems and like I, my foot won't fit in my mouth. So I'll, I'll save you all the effort anyway. <laughs> but this is not just like having a lackadaisical attitude towards privacy. This is an information security failure at this point, more than just we don't value privacy as a fundamental human right, which also is clearly exposed from this reporting but this is this is now to the point of information security concerns. So uh, my foot is in my mouth on that one. Um, Google, hopefully you can still kind of save my rep a little bit there. But anyhow, just just incredible stuff. And, you know, I'm just going to throw it out there. Like, th this is not how stuff works at Microsoft, like at all. Like, this is just mind boggling to read compared to the the controls and, and the things we have in place and the limited amount of access, you know, we have and the things we have to do to maintain access. Like for me to even be able to see, for example, um, any customer information, like, and, and again, that's like really high level stuff. Um, not anything very specific. I have to go through like regular re attestation that I've completed all of this training. I have to resubmit. My manager has to reapprove. And that happens all the time. It frequently will happen where you'll have a peer come to you and say, Hey, my access to this broke. Can you, you know, what do I have to do to get back in? Because it's so frequently locked down and you have to do so many things to prove you still have a business need to access that. And so, you know, I just got to throw it out there for what it's worth that, you know, not all big tech companies are this bad at this stuff because um, thankfully our employer seems to take this a little more seriously. And like Adam said, this was all on the consumer side. I, I hope that their AWS, their Amazon Web Services on the enterprise side 
is much more locked down. And it sounded like in the article, they made a little bit of reference to it because that part of the business actually makes money. And so mm-hmm. they were more willing to invest in the security on that side. So, you know, anyone who's using AWS probably shouldn't panic, but I'm sure oh. all of us use Amazon. The majority of us have Amazon accounts and we buy things on Amazon. So as consumers, we should be concerned about this article, right? Yep. And and yes, it made crystal, crystal clear that this did not apply to AWS. The article went out of its way to explain that point. So do you want to land that as well? This is the consumer retail business that this applies to. So kind of segueing into our last topic and what we what I want to spend the remaining time talking about is I am going to give a talk on zero trust on Monday for one of my customers and it was brought to me that this person this customer is a high level C suite and they are non technical and they're trying to understand what zero trust means because his peers are telling him, Hey, you should follow a zero trust model. You should follow zero trust, but he doesn't know what zero trust is. And so as I was researching this, because as we've talked about on the show, when you present to a C-suite person versus a technical team, your lingo and things that you talk about may change because you want to make it more general. You don't want to get into the weeds because they might just fall asleep or they don't care about the details, right? They want to know the big picture stuff. So I thought it was a good exercise to walk through this on what exactly is zero trust so that we can explain it in simple terms. So if you're at this point, you're a listener and you're like, oh, I know what zero trust is. Okay. Tune it out. If you don't want to, you know, go listen to something else. But I felt it was good to just review for even for me what this really means. So first off, CISA released a zero trust guidance, which we'll link in the show notes. But CISA refers to it as a security model, a set of design principles, a coordinated cybersecurity and system management strategy based on the acknowledgement that threats exist both inside and outside the traditional network boundaries. And so the zero trust security model eliminates implicit trust in one element, node, or service, and instead requires continuous verification of operational picture via real-time information fed from multiple sources to determine access to system responses. Now, that's a really, really elaborate way of saying in the traditional model, we give trust to something. We give inherent trust to something in the traditional security model. Most of the time, it was physical access or the network that they're coming from, right? If you're on the corporate network, you're trusted. If you're coming from a domain joined machine, you're trusted. And that was the traditional model, the castle and moat model, right? And as things have migrated outside of that corporate network, we now have this zero trust model where we give zero value of trust to anyone until they prove through verification, a bunch of information before we allow them to have access, whether that be MFA or a trusted device or a trusted location. And when I say trusted location, I don't mean we just allow things to come from a a location. I mean, like, is this person coming from a, a location that we've seen them come from before? And if not, okay, now we need to elevate. And, I was talking with Adam with you about this on the pre-show and even for people who know the concept, I bet there are a lot of folks who listen to this show who don't have pure zero trust at their company because one of the main practices that people do is they have an allow list or a, a range of IPs where they say, yeah, and if you're coming from this range of IPs, it's a corporate IP, we're going to disregard MFA. So you've literally tossed out the main control that you have to verify identity when they're coming from a network that you know of. And that inherently is trusting anything that comes from that network. So you've already tossed out zero trust model, right? And so, again, even if you're a listener of the show and you're like, Oh, I've heard zero trust. I know what it is. I bet 
a lot of you guys are not practicing it. I know that at my previous company, you know, at other companies, I've talked to customers and the one thing that comes up is, hey, can I put in my corporate IP range and make it so that they don't have to do conditional access? Um, yeah, you can, but the question is, should you, right? Like if you're truly following the zero trust model, you shouldn't do that. I thought, you know, the, the seesaw description here, it is kind of obtuse, but I like it in that one of the things it says is continuous verification of the operational picture via real time information fed from multiple sources. Like that is kind of the money sentence right there because it, it touches on continuous verification touches on real-time information and multiple sources. You don't have zero trust if you do just any one thing. It's all of the things kind of together. And Andy, I'm going to steal your thunder a bit because you gave this great analogy in the pre-show and I kind of took it one step further. So Andy was talking about a great analogy to think about this is going to a bar. And you know, you go to a lot of bars and there's somebody sitting at the door who IDs you and they check your ID and then they let you in and you go on your way. And then for the rest of the night, you can walk up to the bar at any point and say, Hey, I want a drink and they'll serve you a drink. That is not zero trust because there's an implicit trust that while you were ID'd at the door, you are who you say you are, you're 21, you know, that guy did his job. So I'll just serve you from here on out. Zero trust would be every single time you walk to the bar, you're ID'd again. And then I took it one step further to the analogy and said, and they make you bro blow in a breathalyzer because they want to validate that you are also not overserved. You know, you're not intoxicated, so you can be legally served another drink. And that's like there's no trust of your your age, there's no trust of your sobriety before another drink is offered to you. And then to take it even one step further, perhaps you know you're in a college town and you've actually seen this happen where the police walk through the bars and do spot checks of IDs. And that's kind of that continuous validation as well. So even at, at drink time, which is a good time to do a, a re-up on verification, there's even additional controls above and beyond that. And I thought that was just a phenomenal analogy, which is why I stole it and kind of rolled it out here first. But it's so, so good, I think, to help people understand. And Andy, what I liked what you said when you were kind of describing the traditional trust model as well everyone's familiar with like implicitly trusting IP ranges or the corporate network. But you said something else interesting. You said domain join as a trust factor. Oh, your domain join. All right, we trust you. And so one thing I, a mistake I see organizations doing is they deploy a device trust model, which is good. I like device trust models using, you know, whatever solutions they have with their identity provider and their endpoint management provider but the way most of them work is fundamentally not zero trust because they still work as like a one-time attestation that I now trust this device. You know, it's in the name right there, like device trust. Well, that's not zero trust. If I put a certificate on a device and say, I now trust you every time you show up forever forward, that's not zero trust. You have kind of moved your trust maybe from network-based to device-based, which I think is still better, but Zero trust would be every single time that device asks for access to something, I say, are you still compliant with all my policies? And if they become non-compliant, I can revoke their access. Or, hey, one step further, is your threat level low right now? Or are you under threat from an endpoint protection platform that's detected some sort of threat coming on? That's zero trust, where we're looking at the threat level of the device all of the time. And that's just, you know, a couple of examples. And then Andy, I liked how you said it's supposed to trusted location. Like we're not just looking, are you coming from a known IP range, but we're looking from, are you coming from a location that is consistent with your user behavior that you frequently use? Yes, that's, that's normal. Okay, good. But we're going to keep an eye on that. And if you start to come in from a location I haven't seen you use before, then I'm going to be suspicious about it. Maybe I trust that location for somebody else, but I don't trust it for you. Those are all examples of where you've moved to a zero trust maturity model, 
because there's no implicit trust in any of that. And you're pulling in all those different factors together. What location are you coming from? What's your device compliance state? What is your device threat level? Those are all different factors that are being pulled into a decision-making process. Now we're getting somewhere. And that's not to say, oh, if you do those things, oh, we've, we're zero trust, we're good now. But that's more of the mindset we need to come from and think about when we're trying to adopt that kind of model. In the CISA recommendations, they talk about embracing the guiding principles of zero trust. So I won't belabor these principles because I think we all know them, but tr never trust, always verify. So you want to treat every user and device application as untrusted. You authenticate, you explicitly authorize to least privileged access using some sort of dynamic security policies. Always assume breach, right? And that just means that, again, you're not trusting anything that is within the internal environment. You're consciously defending resources that you think there's already an adversary there and you deny by default. You heavily scrutinize all users, devices, data flows, request for access, right? You want to log everything and then monitor it. And then verify explicitly. So access to any resource should be conducted in a consistent and security, secure manner using multiple attributes to basically, you know, all those things that we talked about that Adam said, where are they coming from? What's the threat level of the device? What's the threat level of the user? Is it coming from a location that we've seen you sign in from? You know, is the IP address of the device the same as the the login of the user? So there's a lot of different signals that we then aggregate together and then we verify. In the Microsoft documentation, we also have a recommendation for zero trust. And I thought there was a very interesting section that talked about cyber, uh, sorry, about zero trust maturity model, which Adam mentioned those words, but this is not something you can implement overnight, right? It takes time. And so in the Microsoft documentation, it had different stages with questions that you could ask yourself if you're at this stage where you are at in your journey of zero trust. So I just thought we should talk about them or at least mention them for like stage one, he talked about, are you reducing password risk using MFA and providing SSO to your cloud apps? That's kind of basic, right? We should be all doing that. That's stage one. We, we talk about MFA all the time. Are your networks segmented to prevent lateral movement within the networks? You shouldn't have a flat network. We've talked about network security before and segmentation, but in general, if you're a network engineer, if you're a network security engineer, you should segment your network. Stage two is, are you using real-time risk anal analytics to assess user behavior, device health, right? And those are things that we just talked about. Are you correlating security signals across multiple pillars to detect advanced threats? And then are you proactively finding and fixing vulnerabilities from misconfiguration and patches? So there are tools like vulnerability scanners. There's compliance tools that will do um, different uh compliance stages of your, say, cloud configuration, for example, Azure Security Center or AWS, or there's other like third-party tools like uh, Prism by Palo Alto um, and, and other ones where they're doing the configuration and compliance checks of your, your cloud servers to see whether or not you have RDP open or if you have an S3 bucket explicitly available on the internet, stuff like that. So you should be scanning and proactively finding those things and fixing them. And then stage three, are you dynamically enforcing policies after access has been granted against uh, to protect against violations? And that is kind of the, the gold standard where after you've granted them access, you are continually analyzing. And if something changes, even after access is granted, right, your identity provider and your device, but okay, let's make sure that if you click on something and then the device goes into a threat level. Now something has changed. Let's proactively apply a different policy against it. Is your environment protected against automated threat detection and response across the security pillars? Are you analyzing productivity and security signals to try and help drive user experience and optimization? So a lot of different stages. You know, you don't have to get to stage three right away, but kind of work down this. And Microsoft has a good guidance in 
this document, which will link to kind of walk you through that zero trust maturity model. And there's a lot of good checkpoints in there that you can look at it and say, Hey, this is, this is something I need to do and something I need to work on. So good one to, uh, to have in your documentation stack. What I like about this white paper is again, I think we talked about something a couple of weeks ago, Andy was the digital defense report from Microsoft. And I made the point that you can download this without putting in a bunch of information, having a sales guy or gal contact you. Same with this, this white paper, the URL in the show notes takes you right to the PDF file. No funny business. So it's something you can review and look at. The other thing is I have customers who are 0% Microsoft. I have a customer who is 100% Okta and Google workspace for their environment. And they downloaded this white paper and used it to craft their zero trust strategy because they, they just like Microsoft's approach to it, our, our mindset to it. So even if you don't do a lot with Microsoft today, this is not littered with a bunch of Microsoft technology and terminology and product specific recommendations. It is generalized so that you can use it with whatever tech stack you have. Obviously, it's not going to call out a whole bunch of things that Microsoft can't do. So if your current tech stack can't, you know, there's a little plug there. Microsoft might be able to help, but that's not really the point of this. It is just to, to give you that maturity model on the zero trust journey, which I apologize for saying. I feel like I'm on the bachelor every time I say journey. Um, but Andy, as you went through these, these kind of maturity stages, I thought a couple of things I wanted to call out as, as interesting correlating security signals across multiple pillars. Now, a lot of people might say, well, yeah, we have our uh, employee protection platform and our uh, email secure email gateway. They all go into our SIM. That's awesome. Is your SIM doing automatic incident creation and alert correlation so that as that malicious payload came in through email and then got executed on an endpoint, you don't have to do anything as a SOC analyst to see those in a single view. If not, there are solutions that do that. So just kind of be warned there. Um, are you proactively finding and fixing vulnerabilities? Andy, I think your call out was perfect. You know, that's going to be a combination of things like TVM, threat and vulnerability management, as well as a, a class of product now called CSPM or cloud security posture management, which will analyze like all your VMs in the cloud and tell you all the ones that are misconfigured or whatever. That's, that's a great thing to do as well. Dynamically enforcing policies that, like you said, Andy, is kind of the gold standard, but that is not like a flying car. That is an achievable thing that is possible with the technology of today. You can have it, and this doesn't even have to be a crazy thing to where if a device, like you said, executes malicious payload and becomes under threat or configuration gets changed and it's no longer compliant or a user location changes to a suspicious location are you automatically able to have your environment take action and potentially pull back access? That again is not a flying car, but that is that third stage of maturity for zero trust. Um, do you have automated threat detection and response across security pillars? You know, taking it one step further, we talked about, does your SIM have automatic incident creation and alert correlation? Okay. Now let's go to SOAR capabilities and can you kick off some sort of, automated investigation and potentially even a response to it because there's oftentimes very, very common activities you want to do as a result of this. A malicious payload came in through email. It got executed on somebody's endpoint. It was bad. So I need a list of what mailboxes is it in and whose endpoints is it on? That's something that should not require human intervention at this point. That should just kick off automatically so that the stock analyst is empowered to take actions more quickly. And then the very last one that I want to touch on, because I thought it was maybe the most interesting of all of them, and I'm just going to reread it again and then kind of opine on it. Are you analyzing productivity, P word there, and security signals to help drive user experience optimization through, through self-healing and actionable insights? What that is saying is not only are you looking at all these security controls and threats and configuration and patch levels and all this, it's saying, is your user experience any good or does it suck? Because if you've got this super hardened environment 
but your your plastic Dell laptops take five minutes to boot and have a pre-boot pin and, and all this gross stuff, and you have 20 character passwords, and it takes users 20 minutes to get to their desktop, then they're going to get out an iPad instead and go do shadow IT. And all your security controls are worthless at that point, right? So this is such an interesting part of that you know, to borrow like Maslow's hierarchy of needs from psychology, that self-actualization piece at the top of the pyramid, this is self-actualization where, Hey, let's pat ourselves on the back. We have all these great security controls, but our user experience is hot garbage and users are ending around going around it all the time. Then all of that effort is wasted. And so there are tools from Microsoft and third parties to analyze your user experience on your endpoints and make sure they don't blue screen and they boot to the desktop really quickly and that the user experience is pleasurable to use because now that's when you really are in a mature place that you've implemented all these really strong controls and your productivity experience is still the bee's knees and your users are going to stay within the guardrails you've created because you've created a secure and productive experience for them. So I thought that bullet point of all of them was the most interesting in that it's not really a security call out at all. But it totally is because all the effort's worthless if, you know, the user experience is terrible. Yeah. And I think a lot of times companies either focus, you know, on that user experience too much, right? Amazon. And then, <laughs> and, <laughs> and then disregard the, the security controls. Or, like you said, the security controls are so great and the user experience is so terrible that users will just circumvent it and find a different way to accomplish something that's outside of those security controls. And so it is in the best interest. Again, I'll use the word business partner because from the business and security, like you got to be partners um, in the whole thing. If, if you're not, then you're going to get what you either got at Amazon, which is you're disregarding security or you're going to get the other end of the spectrum where the user experience is terrible. So that is our little pitch and education session, I guess, just revisiting what zero trust means to us and, you know, think about where you guys are at in your zero trust journey. (laughs) Andy, Uh, will you accept this rose? (laughs) (laughs) So, that's it for our show this week. I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation. As always, our contact information will be in the show notes. Reach out to us if you have topics you want us to talk about or follow up on tonight's episode. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.